Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH, solutions for every challenge, equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. Hello, folks, and thanks for joining us here for This Week in Agribusiness. As you've noticed, we're on the show floor at Commodity Classic 2024, and I'm joined by Max Armstrong. Max, how's it feel to be back on stage? Oh, it's great, Mike. There's a lot going on here. There always is. And it's not just the trade show, of course, but a number of commodity organizations hold their meetings while this event is going on. I think the attendance said to be in excess of 10,000 this year. And hoping for another record, and they may well get it. Yeah. It's been interesting to see the growth. It certainly has. And Max, as you mentioned, we're here to talk policy in addition to everything happening. And one of the big areas of policy, of course, is exports and trade. Joining us to talk about that is Randy Sprock. He serves as the chairman of the U.S. Meat Export Federation from Pipestone, Minnesota. Randy, thanks for talking with us. Well, I'm glad to be with you this afternoon. You know, let's get the lay of the land on protein exports, pork and beef. How did 2023 end up? You know, actually, there's good news, bad news. Uh, you, you look at the pork exports, phenomenal uh, uh, amount of volume and value that came back in. We actually set a record amount uh, up over 6% versus 2022. Uh, uh, volume up over 8% here. Uh, we've set new records. It's about 29.6% of our product is actually exported worldwide. So another new record here. Comes to the beef side, of course, we all know that's about the drought and the cow herd, the lowest cow herd since 1951 here. But yet on the other hand, yeah, they're down 12% on their exports, <coughs> excuse me. But on the other hand, it's still the top uh, three, three years that they've had it. So still good news, still a lot of demand for beef worldwide. We, we tend to forget, you know, our nearest neighbor is a big destination, right, into Mexico? You know, that's where we talk about trade. Free trade agreements are very important to us. Anytime we lower tariff and non-tariff trade barriers, the American farmer is so competitive that we gain market share here. Because of NAFTA, Mexico and Canada, they're over a third of our exports. You look at Mexico, they're consuming 10% of the pork produced in the United States here. A very huge, large amount of our hams go to Mexico, fresh product each and every day. Randy, as I look around the world, as I look over at Europe, I see protests, I see farmers in the streets, and I'm wondering, is this going to have any benefits or disadvantages for American meat you know, producers? I, yeah, we've all seen it here, and we're wondering what's happening in the EU. It's due to regulations, yeah, be it nitrogen, be it fertilizer, but also then societal you know, loss of their social license. Germany's down over 20% here. ASF, huge impact what's happening in the EU. They are not exporting as much product as they had in the past. That's going to give us an opportunity for a takeaway. And so if I'm exporting pork and beef worldwide, a takeaway from what happened in the EU, that's going to be U.S. corn and soybean feed grains that are going to be exported right with it. As you think about the overall sentiment towards trade, Randy, 2024, looks like we've got our work cut out for us. We've got our work cut out for us. Uh, there's been a, a lack of initiative for free trade agreements here. I actually serve on APAC, Ag Policy Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Agriculture and U.S. Trade Reps Office here. And literally while I've been on it here, uh, there hasn't been an initiative or a new trade agreement. When I was in uh, president of the National Pork Producers Council, we had Colombia, we had Korea, we had Panama. Those free trade agreements, you look at those countries here now from Colombia, rocketing growth. Korea, rocketing growth. And that's what we need is we need our government to have a free trade agreement, lower those tariffs, non-tariff trade barriers. We are competitive. We will export our products. We're exporting red meat worldwide. That's benefiting U.S. corn and soybean farmers. It creates jobs at home too, does it not? There's value added. It's a great opportunity here for us here. I start looking at the, the, the variety meats. They're not cultural for us. We eat the middle meats on our product here. The loin, the tenderloin, the rib complex, the belly complex. We're exporting the ham, we're exporting the picnic. Those are the things, and the variety meats especially here. There's over $11 a head on the variety meats of pork that's exported back to the country here because we have the opportunity to go to Asia because those, those are culinary uh, that they're desire for them. We can continue to add value. That's what it's about. Randy Spronk, USMEF, thanks for filling us in. Sure, appreciate it. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues. Firestone Ag IFBF tires with 82 technology maximize load capacity while minimizing soil compaction. Visit firestoneag.com to learn more. We're talking markets. Joining us on location at Commodity Classic is Jim McCormick of agmarket.net. Jim, the corn market looks like it's turning a corner. The question I'm hearing from a lot of folks down here is the bottom in for springtime. You got to start with a hard question first, right? Yes, sir. I think the odds are very high. Now, there's no guarantee in marketing, obviously, but there's a lot of signals that it's, that it's bottoming. 
first one is this past week we got through first notice day and what was so critical about it unfortunately there was a ton and i mean a ton by millions of bushels of corn that was priced via the basis contract earlier this year against the march contract they pretty much were forced to make a decision either roll the position which essentially rolls it out to may which is going to add about a 15 cent cost to their marketing or just give up the grain and as we got toward the end of this week or toward the end of last week into the beginning of this week before first notice day, a lot of that grain got flushed to the system so that's part one part two the funds they are carrying a record short position of corn so i think you're to the point there's not much left of the sellers out there end users i think should start stepping in to try to take advantage of it remember we've got a long summer season to go brazil's only half planted Argentina hasn't gone through pollination, so there's a lot of things that could go wrong that could force the funds out of the short and give us that relief rally we also are looking for. If a relief rally starts to come, Jim, do you have a price target that you'd like producers to start scaling in sales? Can we say it's 550? I would say around a 50 cent rally is kind of what you're looking for, 50, 60. I think you get up toward that level, you've got to be on the defensive. The reality is this, there is still a ton of corn unpriced out there. And if you look at the acres, we don't know what the weather's gonna give us, but if you look at the, the starting point of the acres that the USDA Outlook Forum gave us, if you came anywhere near a trend line yield, your carryout's not gonna shrink, it's gonna grow. It's gonna go to two, 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 three, maybe even two, five. The reality is that'll put a stock's use near 17%. And unfortunately, when you look back in history, not far ago history, recent history, 2013, 14, 15, 16, that five year span, the US stock's use bounced between 14 and 16, 17% price 350 so we do think you're going to get a rally but we are really encouraging producers to use that rally to market grain that you haven't sold for whole crop as well as maybe start looking to get a little bit more aggressive for new crop all right soybeans jim we've seen more shrinkage to the brazilian crop where does that market move from here right now we saw a few uh, some unknown sales earlier in the week we'd like to get a little bit more we are not competitively priced brazil still selling beans cheaper than us but you know it's like the corn, they're carrying a big short position, not a record, but that crop's getting smaller. How small? That's up for debate. You know, the government was at what, what, 157? You got other guys saying 150, there's a few people in the mid 140s, and I've heard some private groups below 140. If it would go below 140, I think the market is definitely undervalued, and you will start seeing a rally, as just like the corn, it's kind of a short covering move. All right, let's turn our focus over to the livestock markets. Jim, this cattle market has come back strong, is there more hype behind it? I think there is. I, one thing I would caution producers, if you haven't done any marketing, you might consider buying options to put a floor under it. Why is that? We are in a scary world, a lot of uncertainty, but you're in an election year, you got the Ukrainian mess, you got the Middle East mess. So locking in profits, I think is very important, especially when you look what happened you know, just six months ago. But overall, I am optimistic on the cattle. The demand looks still very strong, GDP. It was a ton, uh, came in at 3.2 this week. It's a point lower than what was anticipated, but the reality is 3.2 is still a fantastic GDP. Supply's tight, so you got a tight supply, strong consumer, strong economy, that's usually a bullish sign for cattle. All right, you mentioned that GDP factor. That's one of those things that's moving the markets. Jim, what other macro level issues are you watching here over the next couple of weeks? I think you gotta watch the US dollar. I mean, that the dollar has been finding strength recently. If that would start to weaken, that would help. The biggest problem I would say for American agriculture right now on the grain side is exports, the lack of it. We're just not competitively priced. We're actually importing beans in from Brazil into the Southeast. No one's happy about it, but it just shows you the economics we're in. So if you got a weaker dollar, that should spur on demand, not just for corn, beans, and wheat, but all agricultural products. All right, we gotta wait and see if that dollar will indeed weaken. Jim McCormick, agmarket.net, as always, appreciate your expertise on these crazy markets we're experiencing. Thanks for having me on. Leave it here. We'll have more this week in agribusiness when we return. Well, it's not just having a place from which to broadcast at this commodity classic. It's having family welcome us in here, the Case IH family. Kendall Quandall joins us here for a moment. Tell us a little bit about your background. Did you come from a farm, by the way? Max, I sure did. I grew up on a farm in Northeast Iowa where my family runs all red equipment. So I've had a really cool opportunity coming here to work for Case IH when that really shaped my agricultural introduction from the start. Well, so you've seen tractors advancing through the years, by all means, as many of us have. Abs in, absolutely. In the Case IH heritage. Yeah. 
there's so much technology coming available into the cab now, and touch on some of those things that really, really matter to farmers and make a difference as they're advancing through this industry. So there's a couple of different things I think that we're really seeing producers of all kinds really gravitate towards, and that's easy to use, consistent experience in the cab from machine to machine. So you'll see as we've introduced new, new lines, the Pro 1200 has found its way from our, our uh, Pumas to our Magnums to the 715 and now to the AF11. And we're also seeing them gravitate towards things like connectivity. So being able to see what's going on on their operation, whether they're in that machine or not. So even if it's a smaller farm, maybe it doesn't have the acreage that others have, you will often see the same technology available in Case IH equipment. Absolutely, so I've had an opportunity with my own family farm to look at how connectivity is used in a very much so an owner operator kind of situation. And my dad, 60, almost 64 year old farmer, very, I'll call him an average farmer when we look at demographics, he's got AFS Connect on his phone and that's something that he's doing to check to make sure he's seeing what's happening if one of his son-in-laws or one of his daughters are in the cab and he's not. So what are some of the features that, that your father, for example, would admire most? What or would matter most to him, perhaps in terms of efficiency of the operation? What's he watching? One thing he likes to look at is machine status, as simple as that sounds. Is it on or is it off? Then he knows, in particular, if we've been running longer than we should have, we're not moving in the field, is there something going on? Does he need to make a phone call? Does he need to stop hauling grain and check in and see what we're doing while he's been, been working on something else? When we're in an era of commodity prices under pressure, it seems that efficiency, that productivity, really has to be elevated, doesn't it? Efficiency is key right now, and it's finding out where in your operation is the, are those inefficiencies coming. And without looking at the data, sometimes it's hard to tell. Even, even fuel usage, I guess. Abs matters, absolutely. So. Why is one machine using more fuel than another? Is an operator running it harder than they should be? Are they putting their tillage tool too deep compared to where we want them to operate? That's something you could glean through something like fuel usage. And especially more and more now as we see that manpower need, and sometimes operators aren't necessarily trained the way you were on the farm. Exactly. And you look at different ways to say, uh, what, where can I put that particular operator? Is it something we need somebody that's got 10, 15 years of farming experience in that tractor? Or is it something where we could put them in a semi because they've got their CDL, they're hauling grain, and we can put somebody else in that for a different operation? Such a treat to talk to you again, Kendall. Nice to see you. You too. Thanks, Max. Kendall Kwanda with Case IH here at the Commodity Classic. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead. Weather has been on everybody's minds. Greg Sodia gives us a look at the whole country now for the week ahead. Well, needless to say, an action-packed period of weather the past week across much of the country, especially centered on the plains, the Corn Belt, and points to the east and south, but uh, not to be uh, left out and underdone, the western states in this still moderate to strong El Nino-driven weather pattern. And here is the next significant system, and these over the past uh, week to 10 days have been taking more of a northerly route into northern California, into the Pacific Northwest, where moisture, including snowpack across the Cascades, has been a little bit disappointing so far. Uh, into this late wintertime season. And there's a fair amount of cold air laying out. Boy, how about that temperature change and shift last week across Big Sky and across the Dakotas? More cold air. If you thought springtime was here, forget about it. So there's one weather system here and another round of at least moisture in one form or another and a secondary system in Northern California. No doubt about it. It's been a tough one on man and beast in those lambing and calving operations across the upper Midwest and Northern Plains. We'll get uh, one boundary to lay out here with, again, some late season art take air up near the Canadian border. Downslope winds, boy, they hit better than 80 miles an hour off the Rockies last week, and we'll push another run of Pacific air into the Plain States and points to the east and south with the next El Nino-driven weather system into Northern California, the Cascades and Pacific Northwest. So those snow levels are rising and the water equivalency improving uh, up there as well. Down here into areas of Central and Southern California and the Sierra Ranges, boy, a nice go of it here this wintertime season. We are in good shape 
landscape with runoff prospects here as we get into the spring and summer months. Warm in the desert southwest. We've had some high wind as well last week across the Rockies and into the Oklahoma Panhandle. Here's the next frontal boundary and a scattering of showers and thunderstorms. A more strong wind potential off the desert southwest with again significant moisture making its way across California early in the week. Another boundary sets up here. This long wave slow moving trough across the southwestern reaches of the country. Even in the desert southwest, some outbreaks of shower and thunderstorm activity back into drier high pressure for the valleys of California. Wind and warmth and storms too. It was a busy one last week chasing severe weather out of the central and southern plains and points on to the east. Speaking of which, another ground blizzard up across parts of big sky country and the Canadian prairie. Much colder air laying out here that just strengthens the jet stream winds. And here's the next weather system with showers and thunderstorms early in the week. And again, maybe heavy and severe over sections of the eastern and southern Corn Belt. What drought? It's basically been eradicated over the eastern and southern complex, still lingering back into the western reaches and the plains. Next weather system kind of running up this southwest to northeast jet stream pattern brings again some mid to late week moisture. Showers and thunderstorms are real spring like feel again coming off the record shattering warmth of last week. Temperatures still above average here in this particular part of the Corn Belt. The cold air up near the Canadian border and still pretty mild across areas of the central plains and high wind potential again downslope winds off the northern and central Rockies. The southern extension of that gets some wind going into the Texas Panhandle here early in the week with new low pressure and a couple of them coming out of the Rio Grande. Showers and thunderstorms over the eastern sections of the plains. They'll turn heavy and severe in the Delta. Lift up to the Tennessee Valley and the Ohio Valley. So again, some added drought relief despite, despite the specter of severe weather once again playing out. But it's that time of the year as we roll the calendar into March across the central and southern plains. Plenty of wind and warmth and record shattering warmth. Readings were 30 degrees above average and they dropped 50 degrees last week. And we'll see that contrast again across the Corn Belt areas with some snow and rain up towards the Sioux. Showers and thunderstorms across the Midwest and that uh, moisture pattern will be making a run into the eastern states with some snow for the southeastern Canadian prairie, bitter cold air from the Suwon northward, and the next moisture maker coming out of the southern plains, generating widespread moisture, probably showers and thunderstorms, central and southern Corn Belt, and snow on up to the north. More severe weather down through the Delta region and uh, eastern and southeastern Texas. Warm conditions for some summer crop planting, corn planting over the deep south and southeastern parts of the country. More wet weather in the Delta region. Drought relief here, Tennessee Valley moving into the Carolinas as we head on through the late portion of the week. We'll have that extended four week forecast coming up in the next half hour. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Pentair Hypro, a global leader in innovative spray technology for farmers for over 75 years. Yes, ag technology continues to advance, and where you see it most clearly is in the ways technology is used to make that equipment more responsive to the farmer's needs. Recently, I had the chance to talk with Bill Ziku, president of Geringhoff North America, and we talked about how that company is using these latest technological advances to make their corn heads do things that before would never have been possible. Yeah, we've got the AFT, Adaptive Flex Technology corn head, and it's different than a regular corn head, like a rigid corn head everybody knows, or even a folding corn head, where gearing off became also very popular. This is Adaptive Flex, so it's an, actually an articulated corn head uh, to where you've got the left wing and the right wing, and they can go up and go down and better fit uh, your field and the terrain of your field. A lot of folks, they'll uh, have a field, they'll, clean, they'll go through with a larger corn head, but have to clean up the, the valleys and the ridges, ridges with a smaller corn head. This lets the uh, operator go into the field with just one corn head. So instead of going in with a, a 16 row and then coming back with an eight row, they can go in with a 16 row adaptive flex technology AFT head and get it all at the same time. But corn heads aren't the only thing that flex from Gehringhoff. Of course, the true flex razor has been around a while. Can you tell us about what you've got for Draper heads? Yeah, on the TrueFlex uh, razor, we've got uh, basically two product lines. We've got a Flex, that's a smaller rigid frame 30 foot head with a flexible cutter bar, the Draper head. So for a, for a smaller head, if you want something that, that works really, really nice for your operation. Otherwise, we have the TrueFlex razor, and that is a three part frame. Uh, each part is about the same, same width. Uh, uh, and we've got the 35 foot, 40 foot, and 45 foot. It has a three part reel. Uh, has flex that goes up four degrees, goes down five degrees, and the cutter bar is flexible up to six inches. 
So it will adjust to the train in one direction through the three-part frame, and it'll adjust to the, to the details of the train with the flexible cutter bar. It's all about meeting those farmers' demands and coming up with the solution that addresses them. And Bill, the other challenge that's been out there, of course, with these tough corn stalks is ensuring decomposition in the field. Can you tell us a little bit about what Gehringhoff brings to the table to help us accelerate decomposition? Yeah, well, we, we have a lot of, let's say, residue management systems, and every field is different, every operation is different, every harvest is different. Uh, we've got uh, just a regular snipping roll or snap roll, We've got the roto disc, which also slices and dices. Uh, we've got the horizon, which is a snapping roll with a with another uh, uh, horizontal blade uh, to cut it down. But we also have the XDC, so that's an extreme decomposition. And what we do with that, it's sort of like the snapping roll, but it's got uh, overlapping knives and more aggressive working edges. So instead of just pinching it and pulling it down, it will actually cut it into two and a half inch, three and a half inch pieces, and it will bust it up uh, on the sides for quicker decomposition for no-till applications. Thanks, Bill, for that update from Gehringhoff. And you know, for a lot of us who may be grown up in this industry, we're used to seeing a lot of familiar names when we go to these shows. But increasingly, agriculture continues to change and we're finding new entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who have been around a while moving into the space. Recently, I talked with Mark Heater about Amazon and their history. Yes, yeah, so we're 141 years old, uh, fourth generation family owned company out of Germany, just came to the US back in 2019. So building our brain and all that across the US slowly throughout the country, COVID kind of put a damper on that, but now we're definitely taking off with a lot more interest. So you've got a lot of interest, fertilizer distribution, fertilizer spreading is where Amazon shines. What does Amazon bring to the table that the competition maybe doesn't? So our spreader is more advanced than the U.S. market with compared to, so we have a lot of technology. Um, we have section control, up to 128 sections. Argus sensors in the back, watching the spread pattern and changing the drop point and spinner speed to keep accuracy. And we also have wind control towers, so depending on the wind direction and speed, we're able to keep the accurate spread pattern behind the machine throughout the day. That's pretty cool, Mark. Has that been getting good reactions from farmers as you talk through the different advances available on Amazon equipment? Yes, a lot of people do not believe they can do that. So a lot of demos throughout the country um, kind of to prove them, hey, there is more technology in spreaders and then be able to show that how we can improve their farm and bring more money back into their pockets. But it's not just spreaders, of course, that Amazon brings to the table. Tillage equipment, I also understand, is a strength of Amazon's. Can you fill us in on, on what you have on the tillage side? Yeah, so uh, we actually are the original high-speed disc. So this would be our 22nd year of the high-speed disc. Um, and then we have our CS tool. It's a combination tillage. Uh, we did the Catch a CS tour this past fall, so a lot of people saw that on social media. But a lot of different tillage options to fit all the farmer's needs. Um, we're there to have a wide portfolio to make sure we can have the answers to what the farmer wants. Now, you mentioned the CS. This is the new tillage tool. What's been the response so far as farmers have gotten a chance to really see it and see it work? Yes, so a lot of our dealers across the country do have the CS for demos, um, find the right horsepower, but we've had some great success in cotton, rice, corn, hay, um, vegetables, all that stuff from California all the way through Maine. So it's been very well successful and a lot of people want to demo more throughout the year. And Mark, you mentioned farmers are finding these at their dealers. What does the dealer network for Amazon look like right now in 2024 and what could be coming? So yes, right now, um, it's still growing. We do range from Maine to California with still a lot of holes in that. So if guys are interested in being the dealers, um, reach out on our website, uh, anything, or call your local dealer if you want a machine. But yes, we're filling in holes, but there's a lot more growth every single day. Mark, if we've got an audience member who wants to learn more about Amazon, what's the best place to do that? Uh, the best way to do that would be go to Amazon.net. Um, on there you can find all of our products. If you want to find a dealer, there's a dealer locator. Um, and then there's an acquire button also at the top. If you have questions, that'll reach out and usually file it back to me. Um, we'll get back with you or have a dealer reach out to uh, answer all the needs you have. Thank you, Mark, for filling us in on Amazon. And ladies and gentlemen, stay here. When This Week in Agribusiness comes back, we'll have more from Commodity Classic 2024. We're going to check in with our friends at the Clean Fuels Alliance and hear what technology is doing in that space. Farm Progress Broadcast presents This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry. Brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge. Equipment for every farm. Case IH. Built by farmers. Yes, the 2024 Commodity Classic was rocking and rolling last week, and there is never a shortage of things to discuss, not least of which 
what's coming in transportation, what's coming in energy. Joining us now is Doug Whitehead. He's the Chief Operating Officer of Clean Fuels Alliance America. Doug, thanks for talking with us today. Well, thanks, Mike. I um, love to be here. Well, I understand Clean Fuels Alliance hosted a learning session at the Commodity Classic. Can you tell us a little bit about what was under discussion? Well, we've been asked to come to the nation's largest farmer-led show to talk about biodiesel, renewable diesel, and sustainable aviation fuel for the very first time. We've, we've been here for years. Some of our members have been to every single commodity classic, but this time we're doing our education session. We're going to talk about how we got here with soybeans and the fact that we need more oil. So where are we going to get that from? Well, let's talk about that. How does the soybean fit into this drive for cleaner air, cleaner fuel, cleaner everything? That's a wonderful question. Thanks for asking. I mean, we were founded in 1992 by the Missouri Soybean Association and University of Missouri did some research. Some other state QSSBs joined us and we had to find a home for the fourth value chain of this, that mighty soybean. You know, we grow the beans for protein, glycerin, food grade oil, and there wasn't a home for that fourth bucket. And so we were really an idea without a product and super proud to say that at the end of 2023, we produce 4.5 billion gallons of biomass-based diesel. And so soybean oil is still over half of the oil that we use. and we've come a long way and we're using just over a billion pounds of soybean oil a month. In 05, we were using 1.5 billion a year. So we love soybeans and, and we need more oil. Can you put those numbers into perspective for us? Let's say just how much more demand can there be for clean fuels? Well, our vision is to get to 6 billion gallons by 2030 and we think we're going to get there ahead of schedule. Demand is fantastic right now. Um, folks are coming to us to try to decarbonize and we're the, currently the lowest cost option to decarbonize now. So renewable diesel, biodiesel, sustainable aviation fuel uses domestically grown feedstocks that are good for the air, good for jobs, and the, the demand has never been higher. Never been higher. And collaboration is so key to unlocking that demand, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So. United Soybean Board, American Soybean Association, USEC, uh, we've, we've all been together since 1991. Yeah. And uh, we continue to look for ways to add value to the bean, to add value to domestic energy security, and to cleaner air and cleaner fuels. That's what it's all about. Folks, you can learn more at cleanfuels.org, right? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Thank you, Doug, Mike. thank you so much for joining us this week. Lots to learn when yeah. it comes to clean fuels. Yes, sir. Greg Soday is back now with his extended farm weather forecast for the nation. Well, Greg, I've heard from a lot of folks down here in Houston who appreciated your forecast last summer with a look at the heat and the dryness that was coming. And they're wondering what's on the maps and charts for the next four weeks, Mr. Solier. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Moisture for this week and boy, I tell you, uh, it will be a busy one. Active moisture laden with moisture in one form or another. We continue to make uh, amazingly so this wintertime season significant drought improvement across the plains and Corn Belt locales, but it unfortunately comes at a price in two areas. Another round of uh, wide temperature swings and probably some snowfall for lambing and calving operations and livestock operations through the northern plains and upper Midwest. Meanwhile, severe weather for Oklahoma in the parts of the southern and eastern Corn Belt again. One, two, maybe some localized three inch downpours expected. Additional drought relief Tennessee Valley. Uh, some field work and planting delays deep south and southeastern parts of the country. And look at the moisture plume across much of northern and central California and the Pacific Northwest. Good news in some of those areas towards the Cascades, the bitter roots that have been on the shorter side of the snow season uh, this uh, late winter calendar date. And welcome to March, by the way. And here we go, heading through the first half of the month. Uh, another slug of some cold air. Nothing too terrible bitter here except up near the Canadian border. Look at still some warmth and record setting warmth over the eastern half of the country and you know the ingredients are set up again for ongoing El Nino driven systems. Not the way the whole spring planting season is going to go mind you for the Corn Belt but we'll get additional moisture here in the southwest. We'll take it. The Plain States more drought relief into the Corn Belt into the upper Midwest and parts of the Canadian Prairie. Watch the severe weather potential across areas of the Ohio Valley into Oklahoma and Texas as you would expect for mid to late March. Welcome to spring 
springtime on the 19th here and the cold air is omnipresent here through the Canadian Prairie that just strengthens the jet stream pattern down across the southern plains, swings the jet stream up into the Great Lakes region. Look at the warmth over the eastern half of the country beginning to fade and so the snow potential gets a little closer here into parts of the central plains, sections of the western corn belt into the upper Midwest. Some additional snowfall for the northern plains. It's late in arriving. I don't care what the uh, calendar date says. Severe potential again. Ohio Valley dry time for planting across the Gulf Coast and again moisture is much needed and appreciated and welcome into the Pacific Northwest as we get ready to close uh, the first month of meteorological springtime. Still some cold air lingering across parts of the upper Midwest up through the Canadian Prairie. Some warmth over the deep south and southeastern part of the country and over the uh, areas of the Pacific Northwest and as you hop down the bunny trail for Easter time maybe some snow into the southern Great Lakes region showers and thunderstorms over the southeastern part of the country but a welcome pattern shift from the Missouri River on westward with some dry time expected across the country. Our Farm Progress Roundup is sponsored by Brandt Industries. Lead the field with Brandt's lineup of high quality, high capacity field grain belts and augers. Visit Brandt.ca for more. There's a lot of conversation at Commodity Classic about what's coming in the world of agriculture. Well, there's a new podcast from Farm Progress that might provide some answers. Sarah McNaughton, editor of Dakota Farmer, joins us now. Sarah, fill us in on this upcoming podcast. What are we going to be listening to? Yeah, so the FP Next podcast is out. People can listen to it now, and all we focus on is what's next. The next genetics, the next technology, the next generation, all about what farmers want to know of what's coming up next in ag. Now, those are some huge topics, Sarah, when we yeah. think about what's coming next. So as an audience person, as I'm listening to the podcast, what's that mean to me? What am I hearing? Who's talking and what are you guys talking about? Yeah, so it's myself as one of the co-hosts and Kurt Arns, who is a Nebraska farmer editor. And so we co-host together and we just talk about anything and everything. We want it to sound like a conversation you'd have with your friends, whether that be at the small town restaurant or at the truck stop, wherever you go. That's what we want to be. Now you mentioned FP Next is out. There are eight episodes out already yes. for folks to go and listen to. Mm -hmm. Of those eight, Sarah, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, so we had a really great one with a UNL on-farm research coordinator where she was talking all about the Wild West of agriculture, which is biologicals, what that's been doing for farmers and what it's looking like. And we just did a fun one about marriage on the farm and don't work house together. So there's some really good episodes out there. And that's some really solid advice, I can tell you, for being married and working <laughs> cows together. Absolutely. So what's coming? What other topics are you watching for for FP Next in upcoming episodes? You know, it's kind of all over the place. We cover just about everything and every topic, and nothing's off limits. So it's something for everybody. And I know some ones we have is talking about how does Brazilian agriculture impact the U.S. That's going to be the next episode that comes up in March. And that's also going to be our first episode that's now powered by John Deere. So we're very excited to partner with them, too. That's fantastic. For yeah. folks who want to get their hands on FP Next, they want to hear how the industry is changing mm -hmm. and how they can use it to better their operations. Yeah. Where do they go to listen to this? Anywhere you find your favorite podcast, so Google, Spotify, Apple, and then we're also on the farmprogress.com. All right, farmprogress.com. Yeah. Sarah, if we can back away, back to the Dakotas. You yeah. are, of course, editor of Dakota Farmer. Mm -hmm. How are things looking for this next growing season? It's been it's been warm this winter, hasn't it? It has been a very warm winter, and after record-breaking snow last year, I don't think we're complaining about it, but I think drought's always on the mind of these farmers. We've had three or four years of drought now in a lot of those areas. And so I think it'll be hopefully hoping for those spring rains. Absolutely. And Kurt Arns down in Nebraska, have you heard mm -hmm. how things are shaping up in that part of the world? You know, he was digging out for a few of our episodes we recorded, so they had a lot more snow down there than we have, which happens never, right? <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. Usually the Dakotas are getting hit hard. Absolutely. Sarah, one more time for mm -hmm. listeners who want to keep up to speed on agriculture, where can they go for FP Next? Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast or at farmprogress.com. Fantastic. Folks, yeah. check that out. Sarah McNaughton, yeah. appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. Folks, check it out, FP Next. You can find it at the farmprogress.com website. While you're there, you can also see all of the other great resources Farm Progress brings to the table. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, where we spotlight another great American farm tractor. Not many days after National FFA Week, some memories of FFA Week and in the spotlight, some tractors that went to school with FFA members during FFA week. Max's Tractor Shed is brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants producers are made to make it last. Well, it's been a long-standing tradition that many of the FFA members drive a family farm tractor to school. 
on some day during FFA week. Let me show you some that went in for an education, if you will. Uh, Mr. Brooks Brown in central Illinois took this big old tractor in there. This John Deere, oh, I think that's about a 450 horsepower tractor that Brooks drove in to the Meridian Macon FFA in Illinois. And his brother was not to be outdone, uh, Bryce Brown. I uh, drove in a little bit smaller, a little bit newer John Deere, I believe, into the Meridian Macon FFA in central Illinois. In north central Indiana, Lauren and Levi Merritt were standing by their family versatile tractor. They are members of the Maconaqua FFA in Indiana. And I think Levi drove it into school. Lauren was already there helping serve breakfast to the teachers as that FFA chapter has done for years. And then you go oh, maybe 30 miles north the Rochester, Indiana FFA. Look at him, whole chapter out there around and on the tires of that big old versatile with a little Ford over there on the side with a chrome pipe. We've noticed over the years that great FFA chapters come to pass because of a number of things. They have outstanding advisors, the hardest working people in the community in many instances. They have the support of the local FFA alumni. That's crucial. And they also have some school board members, some school administrators that really do get it as well. We uh, salute those schools where FFA continues to be very vibrant. Mark Stock knows them well. Here he is for the weekly report from Big Iron Auctions. Well, hello, Max. March has historically been the busiest month for retirement auctions, and this year is no exception. We start on March the 5th. Bruce D. De Bruin Estate Sale in Pella, Iowa features 228 items. Also selling on March the 5th, Kevin and Melanie Quick, their custom silage auction features 41 items. On Wednesday, March the 6th, Bear Creek Farms will retire from Bruning, Nebraska. Their retirement auction features a 2014 New Holland Speed Drawer 240 cell propelled wind rower, New Cooperative from Otho, Iowa will sell 155 items. Triple M Farms Partnership is retiring from Brinkley, Arkansas. On Thursday, March the 7th, Lori Linden Estate Auction in Bradford, Illinois features a Case IH 6140 Combine. Also on March the 7th, Jeff and Vivian Stuckey's retirement sale by Hutchinson, Kansas features a JNM 875-18 grain cart. Max, I encourage all of your viewers to help support these men and women who have given their life to producing the food, fiber, and fuel for agriculture on their retirement sales. Visit BigIron.com for all their auction items. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. And there's a lot of that next generation of American agriculture at Commodity Classic. We caught an FFA. -er. This yes. is Gretchen Anthony. Gretchen, yeah. tell us, where is home for you? Home is Brock, Nebraska. And you are an FFA member there? Yes, I am. Are you active? Are you serving in leadership at all? Yes, I'm the Sentinel. For the chapter. Sentinel for yeah. the Brock Johnson FFA. Yep. And what have been some of your favorite experiences so far in your time at an FFA? -er? Um, I've done many competitions and I love meeting new um, people around our community and new friends and things like that. That's awesome. What yeah. was it that made you decide to want to be a part of FFA? Well, I've always been a big part of our family's operation, so it's been kind of second nature to me. So. Well, what all is on your family's operation? Um, so we produce corn and soybeans. All right, outside Brock, Nebraska. Yep. Now, of course, convention is a busy yes. time for a lot of yes. FFAers. Nebraska, I'm sure no less. Do you have anything exciting going on at convention this yes. year? Yes. So my partner and I did a science fair project focusing on corn byproducts use in concrete to see the global warming effect of it. Now, that is cool. I didn't yeah. realize we were using corn <laughs> byproducts in concrete. Yeah. Wow, and does it help global warming? It does. So we found that corn chaff and 15% of that supplemented into concrete is the best and reduces that global warming effect. Oh, we don't, and you're going to be able to give a presentation about this at convention? Yes, we just found out last week. So. Well, congratulations. That's Thank very you. exciting. Thank Gretchen, you. we wish you the very best in your future at FFA and, of course, at school. Thank you. Thanks for joining Appreciate us. Yeah. Colby Ag Tech is brought to you by Copperhead Ag Products. Visit copperheadag.com for more information. 
On the trade show floor here at Commodity Classic 2024, and no matter where you look, there is new innovations, there are new uses for technology. And that means our tech correspondent, Chad Colby, is kind of like a kid in a candy store. He found one booth where he wanted to spend a few extra minutes. Chad, what'd you find? At the Commodity Classic this past week and all over social media, I'm sure you've heard, John Deere showcased their latest 2025 machines, highlighting their continuous journey toward autonomous agriculture. Definitely a standout moment, though, was the introduction of their high horsepower 9RX tractors. These tractors got a complete redesign. They offer horsepower class of 710, 770, and 8. 130 horsepower, all powered by John Deere's 18 liter engine that does not require diesel exhaust fluid, which is a big deal. Some other great features of this tractor, of course, is the new cab. It's got the Gen 5 display with the integrated 7500 Starfire receiver. Certainly, you can add RTK and all the other stuff to it. It's got all the electric architecture for autonomy. And it's got a split hydraulic system. I really like that. And basically what they're doing is they'll take one side of that system to operate the tractor physically and the other side to operate the implements. Another introduction was the John Deere S7 series of combine. This combine replaces the current class 6, 7, 8, and 9 combines with a lot of refinements. The biggest will be the styling of the machine. It looks like the X9. The cab has been redefined. Looks really good. Certainly a lot of room in that cab. A lot of great visibility. Good styling. But the big conversation is about efficiency. And that comes from productivity of the machine and certainly a claim from John Deere at a 10% less fuel use, which is great. But a lot of the refinements come from the X-Series, like the residue management system. It's got a cross auger shutoff, which is great. I'm looking forward to seeing this equipment, and guess what? You'll see a lot of it, because both the tractor and the combine, you'll be able to order here soon, availability next year. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Well, thank you, Chad, for that update. And it's incredible to me how much technology still gets utilized to improve operator comfort in some of these machines. Not only are we getting better mileage, we're getting better mileage more comfortably, which is always a win. Folks, leave it here. We'll have more of this week in agribusiness when we return. Yes, indeed, farmers come to Commodity Classic for a number of different reasons, taking a look at some of the scenery, but also talking policy and getting the shape of the business for the year ahead. Caleb Raglan joins me now. He serves as the vice president of the American Soybean Association. Caleb, thanks for talking with us. Yes, sir. Happy to be here, Mike. So you're new in the role of executive vice president. Tell us a little bit about you. Caleb, where's the home farm? Magnolia, Kentucky. We're right in the central part of the state. In the central part of the state. You're here at Commodity Classic talking with other soybean growers. And Caleb, What's on the soybean growers' minds in America here in 2024? Well, there's a lot on our minds, Mike. Of course, setting a new farm bill is top of mind. Um, you know, commodity prices are a little lower right now, so we see the importance of a good, strong safety net more than ever. And uh, we're also dealing with several regulatory issues and uh, the dicamba issue. So there's a lot on our plate, and uh, it's important that we have good policy so we can move forward as an industry and uh, take good care of our American soybean farmers. That's what it's all about. Caleb, you mentioned the dicamba issue. That's an issue that has certainly gotten a lot hotter here in the past couple of weeks leading up to Commodity Classic. What's next? What's the American Soybean Association hoping to see as this uh, plays out? Well, we got the uh, existing stocks orders, so we will be able to follow the uh, rules that were already in place coming into this year for application of dicamba and uh, we're glad that we have that opportunity um, for the upcoming year in 25. As crazy as that sounds, we've got to get things in place there. So I can assure you as a soybean farmer, we have the best team in the business that's working behind the scenes to implement our policy, to um, leverage and advocate for the best possible outcome. We need tools in our toolbox. This technology has been invested in and we need to be able to use it so that we can continue to uh, produce soybeans and help feed the world and help feed ourselves and our livestock. 
Absolutely. And of course, you can't talk soybeans without talking livestock. Caleb, the two go hand in hand. They do. To that end, I know there's a lot of discussion around building that demand. From the American Soybean Association's perspective, do you have anything on the demand side you're excited about? Well, on the demand side, livestock's our biggest customer, so we're obviously wanting to do everything we can to uh, move that industry forward. Uh, we like meat, we like protein, and uh, we're, we're also working to build demand around the world for our meal. Uh, our oil is in very high demand for the thousands of uses it has, but uh, you know we need to uh, be exporting our meal. We're working hard to accomplish that. And it's, um, it's a big opportunity. Um, our friends around the globe need that soybean meal to grow their livestock industry. We're developing markets around the world, both poultry, aquaculture, and uh, with hogs in particular. There are some really neat things coming for a soybean grower. If we've got audience members who aren't connected to the American Soybean Association, Caleb, where would you send them for more information? Well, I would send you to your uh, state organization. So I'm from Kentucky, so the Kentucky Soybean Association is where we start. Say so if you were in Illinois, start the Illinois Soybean Association. But um, some states have regional soybean associations, but get involved. And uh, it, it all goes from there. It all starts at the grassroots and comes up. That's right. It all starts at the grassroots. Caleb Braglin, Vice President of the American Soybean Association, thanks for talking with us today. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to you for tuning in to this week in agribusiness. We'll be back next week from the studio. Be sure to catch us then. Have a great week, everybody. This Week in Agribusiness has been brought to you by Case IH. Solutions for every challenge. Equipment for every farm. Case IH, built by farmers. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by 22 Creative Group and has been a presentation of Farm Progress Broadcast. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.